What's going on? Could until now all of a sudden end up being the better choice with at least one of their 10th gen CPUs? With the previous models I've recently uploaded reviews of, while it was always debatable whether to pick Intel or AMD, most of the time the finger of reason pointed into AMD's direction. Guys, today I'm dealing with the last Intel processor of the series that I have bought for my reviews for now. It goes by the name of Intel Core i3-10100. We are no longer talking of 8 or 6 cores, but rather of 4 cores with hyper-threading, therefore 8 threads. Don't let this intimidate you so quickly though, the offered gaming performance here sure is brutal. And the price of 130 to 150 US dollars right now, at the time of this video, and of course also depending on availability, doesn't even seem bad. In fact, fairly attractive if you have in mind building a cheaper gaming machine without going for used parts. But where's the catch? Is there one? And if yes, how big is it? And quite interesting, how does AMD do with their 4-core 8-thread CPUs compared to this i3-10100? Is it going to be a neck-and-neck -neck race, or could Intel for once take home victory again? It's been a while after all. As with the i5-10400 that I've recently reviewed, today's i3-10100, also coming without that ending K letter, comes included with that legendary Intel Stock Cooler 2. That cooler sure is a legend, albeit for quite the different reasons. Horror, in fact. But anyway, we should easily be able to cool that 10100 with it, without having to spend any extra money. Once again, a quick shout out and thank you to the shop Equipper. I can't thank them enough for being so supportive. I don't even have to focus on any deals. They take care of that for me and send the stuff over to me as fast as possible so I can start testing. Without Andy from the Facebook group PC Hardware Community, I wouldn't even have the options I have now. So thanks go out to you too, Andy. Alright, and now back to the CPU. How well does this i3 stack up against the competition in terms of pricing? The i3-10100 currently comes in for around $130 to $150. For the AMD Ryzen 3 3300X, you'd have to shell out pretty much the same amount of money, around $135. But this of course greatly depends on availability. Often these CPUs tend to be out of stock right now. The Ryzen 3 3100 you can or rather should get for something in the neighborhood of $100. However, prices lately go up and down, this simply also comes down to availability. The specs of these three processors appear to be very, very similar, something we admittedly don't see very often with Intel and AMD CPUs. A big difference, as always of course, is the manufacturing process. Intel still is at 14 nanometers. While it has been heavily tweaked countless of times by now, the node is not up to date anymore. More cash and, in theory, a better memory controller can be seen on those AMD counterparts. But keep in mind, this does not always mean AMD has to be better. We've seen that countless of times by now, especially regarding the memory controller. Something I find to be a real bummer over and over again is the fact Intel does not allow for all of their CPUs to be overclocked. And today's i3-10100 just happens to be one of those CPUs that comes with a locked multiplier. I wish they'd finally copy AMD and allow for us users to do some tinkering by playing around with clock speeds. Whether this leads to actual performance increases or not, but let us experiment. As you can see, for my test, I'm once again going for the ASRock Z490 Extreme 4 motherboard, along with the Deepcool Castle 240EX AIO liquid cooler. Needless to say, I'll also include tests with the included Intel stock cooler. And since people will tell me, yes I know, with such a quote, entry level CPU, end quote, it hardly makes any sense to go with the best possible Z490 chipset out there right now. I know that. It would certainly be advisable to go for cheaper, more affordable boards sporting either the B460 or H470 chipset. But I didn't want to spend any extra money on such a board just for this test to be politically correct, so to speak. If I put 100% of stress onto these four cores, a clock speed of 4.1 GHz is and can be maintained constantly across all cores. No sign of any downclocking here. Finally, there also is a smaller deviation of the max stated turbo clock by Intel. At max I should be expecting 4.3 GHz, 
I get up to 4.2 GHz here. Not ideal, but I don't want to start whining and complaining about this again and again, it hardly affects performance anyway. So let's get to the thing that does bother me here, and that being the lack of PCIe 4.0 on in this Intel platform. What AMD is offering us since 2019, we don't get from Intel in 2020 unfortunately. In itself, this feature is a huge thing, but to be perfectly fair, in the case of today's i3-10100, PCIe 4.0 may not turn out to be that big of a deal, at least for most of us users that get a processor in this price range. So I don't want to waste any more time, let's finally see what those benchmark results have to say. As always, don't be surprised, an RTX 2080 Ti graphics card was used for testing. This is to avoid GPU bottlenecks as best as I can. And now, lean back and enjoy the test results. Alright, no doubt, the i3-10100 sure does impress in games. Although in my head, I had expected something a bit more exciting, to be perfectly honest with you. I kinda expected the i3-10100 to overtake AMD by a very noticeable margin in games. That apparently is not the case. Well, maybe in the case of the Ryzen 3 3100, but the 3300X is a tough nut to crack and sure is a bit of a thorn in the i3's eyes, one could say. Because in many games the 3300X sticks to the 10100's heels and in some instances AMD does manage to overtake the i3. But then again, the same thing can be said about Intel, especially in game titles that don't go well with AMD processors, Far Cry 5 being one of those games. And as shocking the results in the by now over 7 year old game Crisis 3 may look, don't take those too seriously. There seems to be a bug with those 10th gen Intel CPUs. I'm sure they will be fixed in the near future for older game titles like this. Aside from that, the Ryzen 3 3300X and i3-10100 deliver a neck on neck race with no clear winner in the end. Especially not if you start factoring in the offered raw performance which further balances out the whole user experience if you will. Obviously the 3300X and sometimes even the cheaper 3100 offers slightly more multi-core performance, which makes AMD the slightly better choice for tasks such as rendering, streaming and so on. We are mainly talking of the 3300X here. Even the power consumption impresses. This time around I pretty much can say the unthinkable power consumption and temperatures do look better on Intel side of things here. Even the stock cooler manages to keep this 65 watt CPU fairly cool with temperatures in the low 60 degree mark. Of course, such a stock cooler by Intel, when it comes to noise levels, isn't the most pleasant thing around, but same can be said about AMD's Wraith Stealth stock cooler, albeit that one is a bit easier on the ears. 
So honestly guys, I can't really make out a clear winner in this case. Fundamentally speaking, you can't do any wrong with any of the two. At the end of the day, I guess it comes down to the overall platform costs. The motherboard for instance. How much does a suitable motherboard cost for such an Intel based system and how much for AMD? Furthermore, we have to keep in mind the FPS gap between the i3-10100 and 3300X does decrease. When you pair these two CPUs with a proper mid-range graphics card, you would normally go for in this price range. So this time around, I may as well could probably tend to go for the Intel i3-10100. I'm not entirely sure, but the low temperatures and low power draw are very attractive qualities for that kind of build, if you only have gaming in mind. Of course, you could now bring up overclocking capabilities, but from my experience, overclocking these kind of processors usually doesn't make up for that much more noticeable performance as one would think. The bottom line is, it's probably best to let the overall costs do the deciding, so costs for the processor in combination with the required motherboard. With that said, bye for now, and I hope I'll soon be back with yet another video.